we will continue with the membrane processes as I mentioned membrane market is very big globally it is become very fashionable uh, and it is uh, operated at uh, atmo uh, atmospheric uh, temperature. So, membranes are widely used in water treatment, purification, removal of salts, removal of uh, proteins. So, both for purification as well as recovery or concentrating and various different uh, applications. Um, several types of membranes um, varying from inorganic uh, material of construction to um, synthetic polymers to natural polymers uh, to composites and so on. And there are different types of uh, membrane processes um, ultra filtration, micro filtration, nano filtration, reverse osmosis, dialysis, electrodialysis, uh, perooperation, and so on. So, a wide range of applications. Um, it is going to replace as time proceeds many of the traditional chemical engineering processes. So, we will continue today as well on uh, the membranes, uh, the applications and uh, various uh, the operating principles. Uh, if you remember this uh, particular slide, we talked about um, the concentration polarization that happens uh, because as uh, the uh, solution flows perpendicular to the surface uh, of the membrane, there is a build up of concentration of the solute in the upstream near the wall of the membrane material. So, the bulk concentration of the solute will be much lower than the concentration near the wall and sometimes uh, these values may be 50 percent or 60 percent or even much larger than that. And the governing equation for this comes from the fixed law of uh, diffusion. So, you have uh, the flux, flux is the amount um, that is flowing that is amount of solute that is flowing per area per time is given by uh, the diffusion coefficient d and dc by dx. Um, dc by dx represents the concentration gradient along the distance. So, x is the di direction along the flow and d is the diffusion coefficient. The units are generally um, centimeter square or foot square or millimeter square per time could be per second, per minute and so on. Now, what are the boundary conditions? At x equal to 0 that is very near the wall in the upstream side of the membrane concentration will be C s and um, at x is equal to d, d is your boundary layer um, this is equal to C b. So, we have these two boundary conditions and it is very simple for you to solve. Now, this um, boundary layer as it is called here this depends on several parameters. Uh, a typical chemical engineer can tell you what are the various parameters on which it depends. It depends on the, um, the liquid properties like uh, viscosity, the density and um, the surface tension and then it depends on the flow of the liquid near the wall. If the flow is turbulent, we are going to have a smaller uh, uh, diffusion distance or boundary layer. If the uh, flow is uh, very, very low, we are going to have very large uh, boundary layer diffusion thickness. Um, like last class I mentioned that uh, um, you can create turbulence uh, near the wall so that you can make the boundary layer much smaller or we can even have cross flow that means you can have the, uh, the solution flowing parallel to the membrane plate rather than flowing vertical to the membrane plate that way we can have much smaller um, boundary layer or boundary thickness. Um, so, if we solve that equation you will get um, a relationship for the flux in terms of uh, uh, d by d. Now, d by d is called the mass transfer coefficient logarithm of C s by C b. Now, this C b is the concentration in the bulk and C s is the concentration near the wall because of the concentration polarization. Okay, Let us um, look at a simple problem. Imagine I am performing an ultra filtration process and the rate of the process is 2.6 into 10 power minus 3 centimeter per second the solution concentration is uh, 0.44 weight percent. The diffusion coefficient for the solute is uh, 9.5 10 minus 7 centimeter square per second. You note that the units for the diffusion coefficient is distance square per time do not forget that and the boundary layer is like this. What will be the concentration at the surface of the membrane in the upstream side due to concentration polarization. So, this equation you substitute for d 
that is your diffusion coefficient you substitute for boundary layer thickness small d and then uh, the the rate is given that is on the left hand side. So, if you solve that you will get C s by C b equal to 1.63 that means, if C b is 1 that is if the bulk concentration is 1 C s will be 1.63 that means, the concentration at the wall is 63 percent more than the bulk that is a big number. So, because of this concentration polarization um, because of the build up of the concentration sometimes uh, um, the rate of uh, filtration slows down because there is a build up of concentration in the upstream. So, you can see how much the concentration polarization is going to affect your filtration process. Now, if your boundary layer is very very small um, that is boundary layer thickness is very small it comes in the denominator. So, if be this becomes small your rate will pick up. So, that is our main goal to increase the um, I mean the, to decrease the boundary layer. Conversely, if we can increase the diffusion coefficient then also your j um, can be made much uh, larger. The permeate flux is uh, given by uh, a really simple relationship j is equal to L delta p, L is the membrane permeability, delta p is your driving force that is the pressure. Okay. Now, there is going to be osmotic uh, pressure which will decrease this driving force. So, in the presence of osmotic pressure what will happen? The j will be equal to L into delta p minus s p o s, p is your osmotic pressure and um, s can be 0 or 1. If the solute is completely rejected that means, if the solute just passes through the membrane then s will be equal to 1 that means, the osmotic pressure will have an effect. If the solute is completely passed then s will be equal to 0, if the solute is completely passed s is equal to 0, if the solute is completely rejected by the membrane then s is equal to 1. So, if the solute completely goes through the other side then obviously, there is not going to be any osmotic uh, pressure that is coming in in the reverse direction, but uh, if the solute is completely rejected then obviously, the concentration of the solute in the upstream will be much higher than the concentration of the solute in the downstream. So, you are going to have a osmotic uh, pressure taking place. Okay. So, that will decrease your driving force delta p here. So, osmotic pressure plays a very important role um, in reducing the driving force and uh, the property of the membrane process uh, determines this uh, particular uh, reduction in the driving force. So, if the solids are completely passed then uh, s will be equal to 0 because there is not going to be any build up of uh, osmotic pressure. If the so, uh, solids are completely rejected that means, the upstream concentration of the solids or solute is much higher than the downstream concentration of the solids or solute then s will be equal to 1 then you will have maximum osmotic pressure effect on the driving force. So, the driving force gets reduced. Let us look at a very simple problem. Now, uh, we are trying to do a purification using a membrane. The solute concentration is 0.1 mole. You are applying a pressure of 5 atmospheres. The reaction uh, the temperature of the process is 25 degrees. Now, if the solute is completely rejected that means, the filtration process is so efficient that in the downstream there is no solute only pure solvent will be flowing and the upstream you have the complete solute. So, if you remember s will be equal to 1 that means, you will have maximum effect of osmotic pressure in the um, pressure process. So, equation becomes j is equal to L delta p minus p o s, p o s is your osmotic pressure. So, you will have p o s decreasing your driving force here because solute is completely rejected. Now, how do you calculate p o s? Before going to that particular relationship 
we will un try to understand what is osmotic uh, pressure and why does it arise and so on actually. Now imagine you have a chamber like this and uh, there is a membrane here, we have put in brine on one side that means it contains uh, salt, it is a salt water and on the other side we have pure water, this is at time equal to 0. Now what will happen? Water will have certain vapor pressure, brine will have lower vapor pressure because you have salt which is dissolved in water. So, as you dissolve salt there is a decrease in the vapor pressure, so the brine vapor pressure will go down, water pure water vapor pressure will be high. So, what will happen? There is an osmotic pressure, so the pressure because of this water will push it and then water will enter here to the membrane, understand. So, what will happen? This level will be higher, this level will be lower. Now, this difference is called the osmotic pressure. So, this difference depends upon the concentration of the brine solution, understand and the operating temperature. Now, if you want to make that water not to go from this side to this side, what do we do? We apply a pressure which is equal to the osmotic pressure. So, by applying this pressure we are forcing the water from the brine to the higher, this is called the reverse osmosis. So, if you want to force water from a brine solution to a very dilute solution or to a pure water, we need to apply pressure much higher than the osmotic pressure that is the principle of the reverse osmosis. Under normal circumstances if you have a, a salt solution and if you have pure water solution, um, pure water and we have a membrane the pure water will diffuse into the salt solution because of the osmotic pressure, because of the decrease in the vapor pressure of the brine uh, due to the presence of salt. So, by applying that equivalent amount of pressure and more, we are driving pure water from the salt region into the pure water region. So, this portion will get concentrated and concentrated with salt and finally, at some point you, the pressure you have to apply will be so high that you need to dis discard this uh, particular salt water and this is the principle in which uh, even desalination of salt water works. There are uh, now many places globally where um, pure water is produced using the desalination of uh, sea water, especially in Middle East many countries, places where uh, we cannot have bore wells. There um, reverse osmosis is used for uh, um, getting pure drinking water from sea water. So, you apply very large pressures, the pressures are very high could be even 100 bars. So, that is the main uh, uh, bottleneck in RO type of systems, the pressures will be very high. Um, so, your membrane system should be able to withstand that and as time goes the um, concentration of the brine solution increases so much, uh, you need to discard that brine solution and then you need to take uh, fresh uh, sea water. So, when you discard the brine solution you are creating environmental problem because that brine solution is so concentrated with salt nothing can survive there, that is the main problem actually. So, um, your RO system has one big environmental issue that is how do you discard this brine solution without causing any damage to the flora and fauna around. The next point is the operating cost, the membrane are very very expensive, so from time to time you need to replace the membrane and um, put in fresh new membranes. So, the membrane cost is also very high in RO systems, but then if you do not have drinking water, uh, if you do not have rains and lakes then you need to resort to this uh, particular technique. RO membranes are also used in um, industry uh, at the end of the waste water treatment if you are interested in um, getting potable water from a little bit of uh, effluent, that means uh, the effluent might not be very um, toxic effluent, but it may be slightly uh, un 
drinkable. So, potable water is also prepared in RO membrane. So, you may have a ultra filtration membrane um, a priori and then finally, you may have a RO membrane and then the water can be recycled and taken inside for gardening and so many other purposes actually. So, that way RO has become very, very important nowadays um, because uh, if you are thinking about zero discharge in industrial setup, then uh, this is the final ultimate solution. Okay. Now, let us go back to our uh, old uh, RO system. In reverse osmosis, the pore sizes are very, very small. Okay. You can see the sizes 0 0.0001 micron. So, generally it permeates only water. So, it does not allow salts and low molecular weight material to permeate through. So, why do we call reverse osmosis? As I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, we are applying a pressure in the opposite direction to the osmotic pressure. That is why it is called reverse osmosis. So, in the normal osmotic pressure, the solvent will diffuse from the low concentration to the high concentration side, whereas in reverse osmosis, the solvent will be forced from a high concentration side to low concentration side. So, the pressures um, as I mentioned before can even be 100 bar here. So, it is very applicable for low molecular weight products such as salts, desalination of sea water, sugars, organic acids um, from aqueous solution. It is used in food and dairy industries to concentrate fruit juices because uh, if you have uh, fruit juices, we cannot go to distillation. And uh, distillation will spoil the flavor and the taste of your fruit juice. We cannot go to solvent extraction because there could be residual solvent left behind and the solvent could be toxic for consumption. So, the best approach is using reverse osmosis. Okay. So, it can be used for fruit juices, it can be used for vegetable juices, for milk. Now, if you look at nano filtration, nano filtration is much, much uh, um, um, finer when compared to say micro or ultra. It is almost similar to reverse osmosis, but the membranes are slightly more porous and it can be used for separating molecules up to 500 Dalton. Okay. So, in nano filtration we can have still um, some molecules passing through, but in RO you are not going to have any compounds passing through, only the solvent passes through. So, the solvent molecules pass from a region of low concentration to the region of high concentration. In osmosis what happens the driving force for the flow of the solvents is the difference in the chemical potential. Okay. So, we have a difference in the vapor pressure, so there is a difference in the chemical potential that is what is called the osmosis. So, when it reaches an equilibrium the um, uh, chemical potentials have to be balanced on the both sides all the osmotic pressure needs to be balanced on the both sides. So, the equation for the osmotic pressure is given by the Van Toff's relation that is called the osmotic pressure is equal to R this is your gas constant T temperature in Kelvin C is the concentration of the solute per meter cube. Actually this is a simplified version of the equation because you will be having logarithm and so on actually. This is generally valid for dilute solutions please remember that is why we got a very simplified equation otherwise you will have logarithm. When you have very concentrated uh, solutions the actual osmotic pressure will be uh, less. The ratio of the actual osmotic pressure to the calculated value is called the osmotic coefficient or also it is called the correction factor osmotic correction factor. So, if you have ionic solutes, you are going to have some dissociation taking place, ions more uh, ions may be formed starting from a single neutral uh, molecule. So, we need to consider the number of ions that are produced also. Uh, so, you have the osmotic pressure equation slightly modified like this n into r into t into c, n is called the Van Toff's factor number of ions produced when the solute molecules completely dis dissociates. Now, if you have more than one salt, so 
salt 1 can have one concentration, salt 2 can be another concentration, salt 3 can be another, then you are going to have summation of pressure caused by each of the salt. So, the total osmotic pressure will be the summation term here and C here can be concentration 1 of salt 1, then you can have plus concentration 2 of salt 2 plus concentration 3 of salt 3 and so on actually. So, it is an additive property if you have more than one salt. So, this particular term um, will lead to a decrease in your driving pressure. Now, if you go back to your old problem, uh, we are talking about uh, the solute completely rejected. Uh, so, what the S here was became 1. So, J will be equal to L is your permeability, delta P is your pressure, P O S is your osmotic uh, pressure. Now, P O S is given by R T C, C is given by 0 0.1, T is given by 25 degrees centigrade that means, 273 plus 25, 298 Kelvin, R is your gas constant. So, that will give you the P O S. So, you know P O S, um, your pressure may be 5 atmosphere, but because there is a negative term and P O S comes in, your total driving force gets decreased. So, your rate in the membrane is decreased because of this R into 298 into 0.1, understand. So, this is how you calculate um, the rate of uh, membrane uh, purification. There are different types of membrane um, configurations which um, I mentioned yesterday. You can have a flat sheet membrane that is like a plate and frame design. We can have a spiral wound membrane that means, the membranes um, material is wound like a spiral. So, the flow also takes place in a spiral fashion. We can have a tubular membrane that means, it is like a tube um, and uh, the tube uh, is the walls of the tubes are porous. We can have hollow fiber modules, it is like a shell and tube type of system. So, all these types of designs are possible. The whole idea is to increase the surface area of the membrane um, per unit volume minimal. If you go to flat sheet membrane, the surface area per unit volume is not is low, whereas uh, if you take uh, the other membranes, the surface area is much, much higher. Okay. So, these are simple schematics of uh, these different types of membranes. So, you have a tubular, you have a long tube, the walls are made up of membrane material. As I said, it could be a organic material, it could be a natural material, it could be a composite. So, your sludgy flows in and uh, the solvent flows out through these walls and uh, you may be getting concentrated liquid. If you look at this, this is a plate and frame design. So, surface area per volume is low here and um, you have the membrane here, slurry flows in. So, if I want to increase the surface area, I will put many, many plates. Um, that is the whole idea of this. If you look at the shell and tube type of uh, situation, we have lot of tubes. This is like a heat exchanger, shell and tube heat exchanger. Um, you have lot of tubes. So, you have a header here on this side, um, you have a header here on this side. So, your slurry flows in, it gets distributed into various tubes um, and then finally, the concentrated liquids again are collected uh, from all these tubes into the header and then removed. So, this is a shell and tube design. So, if the one of the tubes gets spoiled, we will open it, we will remove that tube, we will put in another tube. So, this is how you perform the process. Tubular membrane. So, it is called a shell and tube module. It consists of several tubes of membranes bounded at each end that is a header um, and again um, on the other side also you have a common header. Um, so, the slurry flows in, gets distributed and then the permeate passes through the wall because uh, the uh, membrane walls are uh, porous. So, the retentate passes out on the other side, again they are collected at the header and then removed actually. So, where do you use? If you have very high viscous uh, feed material or uh, you can have mostly high viscous feed material is in either uh, food products or is it in fruit juices, example is like a tomato puri, where you want to concentrate it to a very high degree. So, the water will pass through the walls and come out and the tomato puri which is very highly viscous will flow through the 
um, entire tube. Hollow fiber, we have the hollow capillary fibers of membrane packed into a shell and tube arrangement. So, you get a very high surface area per unit volume. Um, here the feed must be free from particulate matter, otherwise what will happen? If there are any particulate matter, it will go and get stuck to the hollow fiber, it will do a mechanical damage to the fiber or it will even prevent your um, uh, filtration process. So, what do we do? We may have a yeah, pre filtration facility. So, you may have a ultra filtration in the beginning and then you may go to a hollow fiber membrane. So, if uh, if you have a ultra filtration then in the hollow fiber the pressure is applied on the inside of the fibers. Okay? So, that is the driving force, but if it is an RO process then the pressure is applied on the shell side that means, it is applied on the outside. Hollow fiber is uh, preferred in dialysis because um, we are looking at very very large surface area and we do not want to apply big driving force also because um, we are dealing with the uh, human system, um, we the driving force is not large like an industrial scale. So, the other idea, uh, other way of increasing your uh, flow rate or the filtration rate is to increase the surface area. So, hollow fibers are preferred in such a situation. Microfiltration, now this resembles conventional filtration just like a normal uh, filtration process which we studied many many classes back. So, the filter medium is a porous membrane, so it can be used for filtering particulate material, so big material, it can be used for suspended solids. So, it cannot be used for dissolved solids, so microfiltration is almost like a early stages instead of a normal filter cloth, we can even resort to microfiltration. So, dissolved solids cannot be separated in microfiltration. So, we can be used for harvesting microbial cells. So, if I am interested in intracellular material, um, I can use a microfiltration from, from fermentation broth, I can use it for separating blood cells and plasma from whole blood. So, um, what type of configurations do you adopt in microfiltration? We can go for plate and frame, we can go for spiral wound, we can go for hollow fiber module. So, all these types of designs are possible in microfiltration. So, we have thin and porous filter medium or membrane supported on rigid support, it is not like a normal filtration system. So, we can have synthetic organic molecules like polypropylene or PTFE, we can have alumina or zirconia um, and they have to be made chemical resistance if you are processing um, chemically active solutions. The most important points we need to consider is the wettability because uh, um, the membrane should not be very hydrophobic, um, otherwise wettability will be very poor. Adsorption characteristics, will the membrane material adsorb salts, because um, if it absorbs and starts swelling, then that will be a problem. The chemical and mechanical stability, it should be chemically inert, um, otherwise we do not want any reaction taking place with the solution um, and the membrane it should be mechanically stable, because we are applying pressure, um, sometimes you may have solids which may be um, causing attrition to the uh, membrane surface, so it should be mechanically stable. In most of the membrane process, uh, the cost of the operation um, is determined by the cost of replacement of the membrane, so membrane cost is the highest which uh, makes or breaks your operating cost in the membrane process. So, here we can allow even macro solutes, but not colloids and suspended solid particles in the size range of 0.1 to 10 microns. So, the flow of solvent and the solute is because of the convection through the pores. So, it is like a normal uh, sieving or filtration process, the pressures are low 1 to 2 bar only. So, we can operate in a normal flow mode that means, the solution flowing perpendicular to the membrane surface or it is also called dead end method or it can be cross flow mode. The normal mode the feed is entering perpendicular to the filter medium, 
so as the filtration progresses you are forming a cake so the uh, the cake formation um, will uh, decrease your rate of flow and uh, we talked about cake and resistance of the cake and so on long time back so this is a typical uh, place where uh, those issues will come into and if you are using uh, uh, for the separation of bio molecules or microbial cells the clay cake could be compressible as well so if the cake is compressible so there is going to be a nonlinear relationship of the flow with the pressure drop i hope you can recall those equations which we talked about a long time back so the flux here will depend upon the driving force delta p divided by rm plus rc rm is the resistance of the offered by the membrane and rc is the resistance offered by the cake the pores in the filter medium are small so the filter medium also will op offer some resistance unlike the normal filtration in a cloth type of filter the resistance offered by the cloth is much much smaller than the cake so we generally neglect it but uh, when you are talking about uh, this type of uh, filtration micro filtration um, the pores are slightly smaller so we need to consider that also we cannot totally reject that so keep that in mind now the resistance offered by the cake if you recall our old uh, darcy's law this is the equation and delta p raised to the power s because of the compressibility of the cake okay a is your area so alpha is your specific resistance w is the slurry concentration dry solids per meter cube of filtrate s is the compressibility so zero for incompressible okay or one for perfectly compressible so you can have values varying from zero to one v is your total volume of the permeate n is the viscosity of the permeate a is the area of the membrane so um, because as i said the membrane material will also offer some resistance because the pores are much smaller when compared to your traditional cloth or uh, cu or metal type of filter in it so we need to keep that also here so this is a typical equation uh, if you recall from our very early classes the flux is given by all these parameters so s can vary between 0 and 1 so if it is incompressible this term will completely disappear if it is fully compressible you are going to have uh, s is equal to 1 also okay so the s can vary between 0 and 1 depending upon, depending upon the compressibility of your cake so of course uh, if uh, if we assume that uh, the rm that is the resistance offered by your uh, membrane material is very very small we can neglect that okay now uh, in many cases alpha w eta and the total flow rate uh, through the membrane are always constant actually okay we can assume so once the flow rate starts decreasing because of the compressibility of the cake maybe you will stop uh, your filtration you may do a back flushing or you may do a dismantling and removing the cake that's formed and again you will restart your membrane this is like a traditional filtration that is um, uh, regenerating your membrane filtration process now the disadvantages of microfiltration is frequent fouling so you are going to have fouling because of the settling of the cake um, so we need to from time to time do a back flush and remove that cake that's formed so you may be a filtration process back flushing process that is cake removal again filtration process back flushing and so on actually so ideally you would like to have a very long filtration without uh, actually doing a back flushing which will slow down your overall rate so once the uh, pressure keeps increasing slowly and slowly because of the deposition of the cake the membrane needs to be either cleaned or replaced sometimes the membrane gets totally compacted so even if you do a cleaning you will not be able to recover its permeability so at that point you may have to uh, replace your mem membrane material now increasing the area of membrane twice 
decreases the flux by half, okay. but the total volume of the filtrate will increase 4 times. But increasing the area of the membrane will reduce the membrane replacement cost by half. Okay. So, the question is do we have very large uh, area membrane? So, if I want to have very large mem area membrane that means my uh, capital cost of the membrane uh, setup will be high, the uh, cost of the membrane itself will be high, but then uh, replacement cost will go down that means, I will be able to do the filtration for much longer periods of time. That means, the operation that means, the plant will be running uninterrupted for much longer time. So, you need to balance between should I have a big membrane assembly with the large surface area membranes or should I have smaller assembly that means, my capital cost will be less, but then I will be doing the membrane cleaning or membrane replacement quite frequently. That means, my um, process will get disturbed much more. So, can I afford to do that or do I need a big plant where uh, I will have a much larger surface area membrane, then I um, will be running my plant undisturbed for much longer periods of time. So, you need to balance between your uh, real process and whether you can have more stop start, more stop start or you want to have uninterrupted type of uh, operation. So, that all depends upon uh, what is the product you are manufacturing, what is the fermentation that is taking place, what is the fermentation time and uh, so on actually. So, if your fermentation uh, broth can be stored in uh, a tank intermediate tank and then you can do a filtration in a membrane process. So, that your fermenter is not disturbed when you stop and start your membrane filtration. Then uh, you may be able to afford to have a smaller uh, membrane unit with the lower surface area. Whereas, uh, you cannot afford to store your material after fermentation, but you want to quickly do a filtration because maybe um, the biomolecule or a bio product is very sensitive to the salts present or the toxins present that you want to quickly filter and recover. Then in that case, you will not be able to um, store it, but uh, you want to um, you will not be able to have too many start and stop. So, in that situation you will like to have a large membrane assembly that means, you will have a larger surface area membrane as well. So, the build up of solids on the membrane can be minimized by installing a depth filter upstream. So, we can have a pre filter or a depth filter I talked about depth filter also before. Uh, so, that depth filter will remove a large amount of uh, quantity of your suspended solids and then we can go to a membrane. So, the build up of cake in the membrane will be much less. Another disadvantage of microfiltration is concentrated slurry and not a dry cake. So, you will not get a dry cake the pressure you are applying is only 1 to 2 bar. So, the build up of solid will be more slurry rather than a dry cake that means, the slurry again um, needs to be processed if you want a dry cake that means, we may have to take it to a oven or a dryer where we remove all the solvent or water and then you get the dry cake which can be disposed of. As uh, the filtration takes place you are also going to have the increase in viscosity that is another problem in the microfiltration. So, the viscosity of the slurry as the solvent is removed is going to increase. So, it will retard your uh, permeation or uh, membrane filtration process. So, these are some of the disadvantages uh, of uh, the uh, this type of uh, filtration microfiltration. So, if you want to um, keep the rate of uh, filtration high, we have to keep on increasing the pumping to sustain the cross flow. Okay. So, sometimes we may go into microfiltration followed by conventional filtration or even centrifugation to separate the solids uh, completely. Now, let us go to ultra filtration. Now, ultra filtration the pressures are slightly higher. So, in microfiltration we are talking about 1 to 2 bar then goes to ultra filtration where the pressures are around 2 to 10 bar. 
So, it, separation is based on the molecular sizes. So, it is very useful in separation of high molecular weight products, polymers, proteins, colloidal materials from low molecular weight solutes. So, I want to separate out proteins and also have some low molecular weight solutes. It can be used for concentrating and uh, clarifying fruit juices. That means, uh, uh, we can concentrate fruit juices. Um, as I said, we cannot use distillation here. We can even clarify fruit juices, because when you prepare fruit juices, you may have suspended matter, which um, will spoil the appearance of your fruit juice. We can use it for recovery of whey proteins, when you are manufacturing in cheese. We can use it for concentrating cell free fermentation broths containing monoclonal antibodies. So, that means, uh, I want to remove whatever cells that are still left behind during my conventional filtration or during my micro filtration, then I can go to ultra filtration. So, this comes as a second step in my filtration process. So, the material of construction, we can have polysulfones or other polymers, it can have finely made uh, micro porous and the pore size could be asymmetric also. So, this pore size is much smaller than micro filtration, pore area per unit surface is also less. So, the flux will be much lesser when compared to MF. So, the liquid flows through the membrane because of viscous flow and you are applying moderate pressure here. The osmotic pressure is negligible in microfiltration when compared to RO or when compared to nanofiltration, because you have high molecular weight of the solutes. Okay. So, the microfiltration uh, operates more like a um, viscous flow. The flux in ultra filtration is reduced due to concentration polarization. Okay. Because um, slowly, slowly the solids are going to get accumulated, the solute is going to get accumulated in the upstream um, at the surface of the membrane. So, the flux starts decreasing. Okay. We cannot keep on increasing the pressure drop, because again uh, that depends upon your membrane uh, characteristics. So, here also you are going to have uh, incompressible gel layer formed, because of the concentration polarization. And if you remember, um, the concentration polarization equation is j is equal to k logarithm um, g by c b. Okay. Now, k can be called a constant or it is made up of a diffusion coefficient, it is made up of a boundary layer and so on actually. So, j is independent of uh, pressure drop, because j depends only on the diffusion coefficient. Um, now, we have only diffusion coefficients coming into picture, the boundary layer coming into picture, the concentration in the bulk and the concentration of the gel or concentration at the polarization layer comes into picture actually. Okay. Now, J is independent of pressure drop. Now, rate of loss of solute will be equal to solute flow through the permeate. Okay. So, what we have is uh, d v c by d t is equal to J into A into C p okay, or um, d v c by d t is equal to j a c into 1 minus r, where v is your uh, retentate volume, c and c p are the concentration of the solute in the retentate and the permeate, a is the area of the membrane or is the retention coefficient. Okay. So, R is your retention coefficient, A is your area, C p is the concentration of in the permeate side, C is the concentration um, in the solute in the retentate. Okay. If the retention coefficient for a solute R equal to 1, then V c will be a constant, okay. V c will be constant here. So, uh, because uh, 1 minus r will become 0. 
if r is less than 1 then we can take out c outside um, and then have dv by dt or we can take v outside then the it will become dc by dt this is equal to jac 1 minus r this is for r less than 1 that is the retention coefficient. Now, dv by dt can be replaced by j into area, j is your flux, a is your area. Okay. Okay. So, what we have is an equation here, this equation tells you how the changes in the filtration rate or how the changes in the concentration affect your flux on this side. That is what this uh, particular equation tells you and this equation is valid if r is less than 1. If r is equal to 1 then uh, we will be neglecting that part. So, you see in uh, ultra filtration the concentration polarization plays a very important role whereas, in a micro filtration it is more like a normal filtration process where the compressibility of the cake plays a very important role. So, there we are not talking about any concentration polarization, their build up of cake it is like a normal um, filtration process using a cloth or a metal sheet or something like that. But here the concentration polarization and build up of the solute which forms a gel which will slow down your rate of filtration as the gel concentration keeps increasing the rate of filtration also keeps uh, decreasing. Um, so, as the gel layer increases again the rate of uh, filtration also keeps uh, going down. So, at some point we need to um, re either uh, remove this gel layer by uh, doing a back flushing and beyond some point we may have to replace the uh, filter medium itself. That means, we need to replace the membrane material itself to bring your rate of filtration to its uh, desired or um, normal value. So, these are the two main things that happens when you are talking about your yeah, um, micro filtration and the ultra filtration. So, we are going to use quite a lot of uh, solute okay, and during this ultra filtration process um, because of the concentration polarization and the solute does not uh, uh, diffuse in through the um, gel layer or the concentration layer. Okay. So, we will continue on this further in the next class.